Hello, and thank you for joining us. I am honored to welcome Dr. Maria Van Krakow from the World Health Organization. She has agreed to share an update on COVID, something that is still top of mind for millions of people around the world. Thanks for joining us, Maria. Thanks so much for having me. So I want to start out with kind of a level setting question. We heard earlier in the program that the pandemic has ended in many parts of the world. Do you agree with that? And I assume not. Uh, what is the state of the pandemic? Unfortunately, the pandemic is is not over. Um, we're certainly in a different stage of this pandemic. Um, we're in a much better position than we were in the beginning, even a year ago. Um, but we still have millions of cases being reported each week. And that's on the backdrop of surveillance and testing dropping massively around the world. So we actually believe that there are many more cases that are out there of either new infections or reinfections. Um, so millions each week reported to us. Deaths are around 8,000 to 15,000 deaths per week from COVID-19. So we're still very much in the thick of it. Now, many countries have ended this emergency phase of this in their countries because they've had access to these life-saving tools like diagnostics and therapeutics and vaccines, but it's not the same around the world. We still have 32% of the world's population that has yet to receive a single dose of vaccine. And with waning immunity over time, given that we're in the third year of this, um, we expect there to be further waves of infection. But because we have tools, those further waves of infection don't need to translate into further waves of death. So we're in a much better place than we were in the beginning, but there's a lot more work to do. And that's what we're here to do and this emergency in every country on the planet. So I know you don't have a crystal ball, but picking up on what you just said about future waves, are there, you know, among the new variants that we're seeing uh, pop, pop up in the sequencing, are, are there any new concerns about a wave in the, in the not too distant future? There will be further waves in the future. Um, you know, I think what we need to be is prepared for that. Um, Omicron, which is the dominant variant of concern around the world, um, is in every country right now. There are more than 200 subvariants of Omicron that we're tracking at the moment. Some of them are more concerning than others, but they all have properties of increased transmissibility. Some of them have immune escape, which means our immunity is not as strong, either from past infection or from vaccination. So they don't work as well. They still work incredibly well at protecting, preventing severe disease and death, but we don't know if these further variants that will emerge will have more or less severe severity. And that uncertainty means we have to be ready. We have to be ready to scale up and scale down our response. Look, we understand that COVID-19 is not the only problem or even the dominant problem in some countries, health or non-health. We have other health emergencies. We have war. We have climate change with flooding and hurricanes. We have drought. We have displaced people. There's a lot of challenges that countries are facing, economic crisis, energy crises. And COVID is one of the problems, one of the challenges that we have to deal with at a global level. But COVID-19 has solutions. We can reduce the spread while keeping our businesses open. We can reduce the spread while living our lives a little bit more safely than we did uh, previously to this pandemic. And we have vaccines. We've had more than 12.7 billion vaccine doses administered to date, and yet we have a billions of people that have not yet been vaccinated. So, you know, vaccine equity is not a hashtag. This is a real challenge that we as WHO are trying to address with our partners. And even in high income countries, low income countries, if you look at who is vaccinated, this is our biggest concern. The people who are most at risk for severe disease, over 60, people with underlying conditions, immunosuppressed populations, and critically our frontline health workers, a large proportion in almost every country are missing the full dosage of vaccines that are required, which means they're vulnerable, which means those individuals can end up in hospital. And our hospitals, frankly, around the world are just overburdened. So there's just more to do, but I'm hopeful in my crystal ball looking forward um, that we can tackle this. We just need the agility the patience, the vigilance, and you know, to, to handle it. And that's hard right now because people are tired of talking about this. I'm tired of talking about it too, but we have a responsibility to do what we can to keep people alive now. So we, we solicited questions from the audience before this program. And one theme that really came through uh, was in a really simple question from 
someone who stayed anonymous who asked, is COVID ever going to end? Is it? The pandemic, the emergency of COVID will end. Yes, I can say that hand on heart. What I can't say is when. So we will live with this virus. This virus is not going anywhere. SARS-CoV-2 will be a virus that will circulate, but COVID-19 is a disease that we should be able to manage. People don't need to die from COVID-19, from infection from this virus. And we can do that because we have diagnostics that can get patients into that clinical care pathway early, get the antivirals that they need early in their disease course. Um, we have therapeutics that deal with severe disease and we have vaccines that prevent all that from happening in the first place. So there's a lot that we need to be able to do. We need to live with COVID-19 responsibly. We're not there yet. To allow the virus to spread uncontrolled is not a good situation because of the uncertainty about the viruses and, it, and its ability to mutate and to change. So we have to handle both sides of this equation, reduce morbidity and mortality, severe disease, reduce severe disease and death. We can do that with the tools we have, reduce the spread, while living our lives safely. We can do that with, with some distancing, with wearing of masks indoors, with improving ventilation. There's a lot that we can do here, keeping our hands clean, which are good for not just COVID, but for other diseases that are circulating. Um, it will end, you know, and I know a lot of people out there are really suffering, not just from the disease itself, but from the impact of this virus. Um, people have suffered, families have suffered, communities, businesses. We have to find a way to manage this responsibly. We can do this. I feel like a cheerleader sometimes, but I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep keep at it and keep saying this because, you know, of all of the global problems that we have that don't have solutions right now, COVID has solutions. We just have to use them and we have to be, we have to be agile. And again, it's tough right now, three years in, um, but there's a lot that every everyone can do and everyone still has a role to play in this. So I, I want to zoom out a little and it's been a really intense few years for you and for Dr. Ryan and for others at the World Health Organization and for the millions of nurses and doctors and allied health professionals who have borne the brunt of this illness. When you look back, is there anything that you've learned over the course of the global COVID response that changes the way you think about public health, either in a positive way, a negative way? Like, what have you learned from this experience? Oh my goodness. I mean, how much longer of the program do you have? It's everything. I learn something every day. I mean, the, the humility by which we need to tackle these big challenges is, is something I think that stays with us. Um, there is always something to learn, and I think I learn something every day. It's how you apply that. What do you do with that information, and how do you apply that going forward? I mean, the world was unprepared, and we remain unprepared, unfortunately. We're in a better position because the world has gone through a trauma, and, and we've, we've changed some systems. We just need to sustain that going forward. I mean, personally, I am so fortunate to work at the World Health Organization. I am privileged to work here. I feel privileged, and I'm in a very privileged position to be able to lead our health operations and technical aspects of the response. The, the forward-facing aspect has, is, a, is an additional thing that I do, which again is a privilege, but it comes with, with a massive responsibility. Um, communicating uncertainty in an evolving event where the data is changing, your understanding is changing, um, is in exceedingly difficult. It still is because people just wanna know the answer. I've had so many people say to me like, okay, when will the science just end? Can you just give me an answer so then we can move on to the next question? But that's not how this works. You're learning and you're constantly in the position that I'm in. I work with technical partners all over the world, hundreds of thousands of people in every country. And we gather information, every shred of information we can, we distill it, we, dis we debate it. And then we turn that knowledge into know-how and then that know-how into how-to. And we work with our partners, we work with communities, we work with health professionals, we work with businesses to turn guidance into policy. And that's not the same thing, but I learn something every day. I, I'm grateful for the resilience of people. I'm grateful um, for the honesty and the interest that, that people have in wanting to absorb information and to, and to pull for good information. Um, I'm, I'm, concerned that we are not addressing the inequalities that existed before this pandemic that still exist now and were exacerbated during this pandemic 
that is something that we have to learn and build from. And I'm concerned that the sense of complacency is not building a stronger foundation for the future. So for me, responding to COVID is about pandemic preparedness going forward because everything we do now is laying a stronger foundation. So in the role that you play and the role that the audience plays, what are you doing to be better prepared to deal with the current crisis? And maybe the crisis is over exactly where you are, but what are you doing in the situation you are to be better prepared the next time? Because unfortunately there will be, but it doesn't have to be like this. Um, and we can mitigate these impacts. Um, but I, I don't know, I'm learning all the time. Um, but communicating uncertainty, um, acting with humility is, is something I think all of us um, need to learn and need to relearn. So, yeah. Well, no, that's really helpful. And, you know, as someone who has consumed a lot of information that you and others have shared from the podium at, at WHO, I have to say that one of the things that really stands out is your willingness to say, I don't know, which might be the hardest yeah. words in the English language. Uh, so, you know, that brings me to another area I'd like to explore, which is, you know, COVID arrived at a time of declining trust in institutions around the world. Uh, as, as one of the people who's been responsible for communicating about COVID and thinking about the next pandemic or the risk of, ne of the next pandemic, what role does trust play in these communications? And, you know, is there a link between societal trust and public health? Oh, absolutely. I mean, trust is everything. Um, you know, outbreaks and begin and end in communities. And if you don't have trust, if you don't have trust before the event, it's very difficult to build that during. Um, and this pandemic has challenged all of us. I think, you know, communicating what you don't know is not enough. I have no problem saying I don't know, but I want to be in a position to say we don't know because the answer isn't there yet. Not because I don't know because I haven't done my homework or I haven't reached out to the right groups. But in my, my own community, in our communication around this, it's we say what we know, we say what we don't know, and we say what we're doing to find out. Because it's not enough to say, I don't have the answer yet. I want people to hear from us as the World Health Organization that we have reached out to people around the world to answer that question. And then when we answer it, we ask it again because we have the next variant or some kind of change. But communicating that to people, it's all about trust. Trust is very hard won and easily lost. So I think for us, it's, it's important that we're out there regularly. And, and if we get something wrong, which we have, because we're human and it's difficult, you come back right away and say, let me, let me clarify, let me correct that. That doesn't make the news. What makes the news is, you know, if you slip up, but right. you know, we're, I'm human, I, we're all human and, and we've made mistakes. Everyone has made mistakes, but you gotta keep coming back. And I think the openness, the honesty in it um, is, is really, really critical, but there's a lot that's, um, chipping away at trust. And mm -hmm. that is something that we just constantly need to be, to be working at trust is at an all time low at a global level. And that we need to work really hard at rebuilding trust over the next many, many years. So speaking of humanity, one of the, and here's another audience question. We only have about a minute and a half. So, and I've one other question, but first, so burnout is a huge problem for frontline health workers around the world. Um, and what the audience member wants to know is as someone who has been at the forefront of the global pandemic response, how have you managed to keep it together and avoid burnout? Are there lessons you can share with other public health messengers? Well, look, uh, it's been an incredibly challenging couple of years for me personally, for all of us. Um, and you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. So I'm struggling just as, as many people out there are. I feel a, a real sense of responsibility and drive because I know what we need to do. I work with amazing people at WHO and with our partners. I have a family that is incredible. I have friends that have been supportive in this, um, but this has been difficult. So I, I don't think we should shy away from that and talking about the challenges that we are facing and how we're working through this because I think all of us need to deal with the mental health aspects of this and the challenges going forward, but we have a goal and the goal is to end this everywhere. And that's what get me, gets me out of bed every day. And that's what gets me to work with many amazing people around the world. So let's end on a really positive note. You mentioned family, I have a child, lots of our audience have children. 
the hardest questions are coming from kids and they want to know how can you reassure me that it's everything's going to be okay what would you say to those children that's that's it's a very very difficult question but I think we have to work together. I mean, children offer incredible insights into the future of, of how they're going to deal with things. I take a lot of inspiration from children and from the youth around the world. They are inheriting problems that we are leaving them, but we can do better and we can all do better. It's an opportunity to bring them to the forefront and bring them into the solution um, because they are incredibly brave and have incredibly great ideas um, that all of us need to utilize and think going forward. But we have to work together. Um, and, and, you know, we reassure our children as best we can every day. Um, we hug them, we hold them tight as fiercely as we can, but we have to fight for kids everywhere in the world. It's not just about our own children, it's about them everywhere. So we have to fight this inequity that exists around the world so that all kids can remain safe. Well, that is a wonderful way for us to end this all too short conversation. Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, thank you very much for your work and for taking the time to speak with us today. Please know that we stand ready to help the World Health Organization and others around the world in any way we can. But thank you again for coming and joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.